Hi everyone, I am Ko Utrez, PhD student at Graz University of Technology and in this video I would like to talk about EMI rejection ratio for my lab students. EMI rejection ratio is a figure of merit for characterizing the conducted immunity of analog ICs, especially for operational amplifiers. And if we take a look on the Texas Instruments homepage, we can just look for EMI rejection ratio. And then we'll find some application notes. And in this video, I would like to talk about this application note, AN1698. So please have a look on this application note before coming to the lab, but we will discuss the basics now in this video. So if we think about an operational amplifier, here we have the plus input, here we have the minus input, then here we have our output, and we also supply our op amp. So what happens if we apply an RF signal here to our inputs? So we can apply an RF signal at our plus input, at our minus input. We could also inject an RF interference to our supply pins, but also to our output. So what will happen now? So let's simplify our problem and just imagine we apply an RF signal only to our plus input and connect our op amp as a buffer. So the interesting thing is that we will see a DC output voltage here at our output. It's like an offset. And why is this the case? So the Easy explanation is every time if you have active components or non-linearities, you will have a rectification. Don't worry, this is not an analog IC class, but I would like to use the differential input stage of an op amp as a good example how this DC offset at the output can occur. So if we take a look at our transistors of our input stage, then by design we would like to operate them in saturation region. Our current can be calculated with a factor k divided by 2 times VGS minus the threshold voltage squared. And now VGS squared leads to a DC component because let's say here we have our VGS and we apply our EMI voltage here. So oversimplified, let's say we apply VEMI times cosine omega t. So this is our RF signal. So what happens? We get VEMI squared times cosine squared omega t. Now, what is cosine squared? Cosine looks like this. And now cosine squared looks something like this. Or in other words, cosine squares is equal to one half plus cosine two omega t half. And here we have it. First, we have cosine with two times the frequency, which means it's a second harmonic, but this is a different topic. And here we have our DC component. So our interference voltage causes a squared DC component at our output. Thanks to our feedback here, our op amp responds to this DC offset at the output by keeping here the differential voltage close to zero. But you might remember this graph here as well. It shows that our amplification degrades at high frequencies. With our transit frequency here, the point where the amplification is only one. Usually we use here a feedback resistor and here a second resistor. With feedback the amplification looks something like this, which increases our bandwidth. So what does this region here mean? Our system loses its ability to self-regulate itself because our feedback loop is not working properly anymore for high frequencies as its ability to regulate fades away the closer we come to the transit frequency and at the transit frequency our op amp loses its ability to keep 
the differential voltage between our inputs close to zero, which means at one side there will flow more current. It cannot regulate away our DC component at the output, meaning that this part becomes more prominent now. But this rectification not only happens at our input stage, basically at any pin where we introduce our EMI voltage, we can get this rectification. Oversimplified, we can just say we have a lot of PN junctions in our IC. And if we now apply a sine wave here, then we expect at the output to see something like this. Our AC signal gets rectified and has now an additional DC component as well. Now with this motivation, let me now introduce the EMI rejection ratio as a figure of merit. Now let's say we apply an RF signal that's 100 millivolt peak and we can now divide those 100 millivolt by the DC offset at the output. And then we put this into a logarithmic scale and we call this the EMI rejection ratio of our plus input. And it's important to note that delta V offset, it's the input referred offset voltage. But here we have a buffer structure with an amplification of one, which means that it's equal to VDC here at the output. And now depending on your input, you might not be able to apply 100 millivolt, but you may want to increase or decrease this test voltage. So let's say we apply 200 millivolt peak and now the assumption is due to a quadratic relation that this doubling the test voltage leads to four times the DC offset shift, which means we need a correction factor. So what happens here? By applying a larger RF signal, our EMI rejection ratio will initially decrease, but we will here add another factor that will compensate this decrease that we refer our result back to a 100 millivolt peak test voltage. Because here we have a logarithmic function and we are dividing by a larger number, which means that we are here on this side. So this minus together with this minus will help to increase our email rejection ratio again. So now let's have a look again at our application node and here we can see again the definition of the EMI rejection ratio and as discussed before, if we increase our RF signal by 10 decibels in amplitude, we expect to see 20 decibel difference in our offset voltage. And therefore here we have a correction to refer it back to 100 millivolts. Be careful in this application node, there is a tiny error here this plus should be a minus because these two terms they are also reversed. So the whole test procedure is straightforward. First we are applying an RF signal to one of the pins of our op amp. Then we are performing two measurements. One with RF signal, one without RF signal. To calculate the difference out of the two to obtain the offset voltage, the DC shift at our output, that we need to calculate our EMI rejection ratio. And in case we are applying a different test voltage than the 100 millivolt peak, then we can add this correction factor to refer back to the 100 millivolts. And now we have different test setups for each pin we would like to test. So this is here the test setup for the positive input of our op amp. So in addition to the structure discussed before, we also add here a termination resistor with 50 ohms at the input where we inject our RF signal. We use here some decoupling capacitors at our supplies. And here we also add a tiny capacitor at the output so that our measurement will not get disturbed by the RF signal. And here we can also see the test setup for the negative input pin. So our RF signal here sees a low impedance path here through capacitor C1. And then here it will decide to get injected into the negative input pin of our op amp. 
Now different to the positive input pin, here we have an amplification factor of two. So you need to be careful. If we model the offset voltage of an op-amp, we can put the voltage source here. So this is a DC source. And this will see an amplification of two because then it's a non-inverting structure. One plus one divided by one is equal to two. And we can also characterize the EMI rejection ratio of our supply pins as well. So our RF signal is injected here, sees a low impedance path through capacitor C1 and gets injected into our op amp supply pin. And here we need our bias T, which we have discussed in our previous two lab exercises. So our DC power supply sees a low impedance path here, but the high impedance path here. So the DC path goes in this direction and the AC path goes in this direction. And we can do the same here for the negative supply pin. We have a buffer structure here again, so the amplification is here one. And then we can also characterize the EMI rejection ratio of our output pin. So we inject our RF signal here directly into the output pin of our op amp. Here we have a amplification of 95, which results from 9.7 kilo ohm plus 9.7 kilo ohm divided by 100 ohms plus one, because if we want to model our DC offset voltage here at the positive input of our op amp, it will see this amplification. And now the EMI rejection ratio is not the same for every pin. So this graph shows that it's expected that our inputs, both positive and negative, will show the lowest EMI rejection ratio. And remember, we want to have large values for EMI rejection ratio. So this is bad. And then finally, we have here figure eight. On the x-axis, we have we are increasing the injected RF signal. And on the y-axis, we are looking at the EMI rejection ratio. So on the left side, you can see if we apply a very low interference voltage, then the resulting DC offset is so low that we cannot measure it. And on the right side, you can see a decrease of the EMI rejection ratio to more RF power we are injecting. And this is the reason why we need to use this correction factor on the right to obtain comparable results. For our lab exercise, I have prepared two measurement instruments. First, here we have our CMAU200. And second, I have here this Siglent voltmeter. So we will use the CMU200 to generate our RF signal. And we will use our Siglent voltmeter to capture the DC voltage. And then we will use our PC for automation. So we can connect our voltmeter with a USB cable to our PC. And we connect the CMO200 with a GPIB cable. And then we are writing a Python script where we use SCPI commands to control our two devices. And no worries, I've already checked the manuals of both measurement instruments to check for all the commands we need to remote control them. And I've put them here in the Python script. And we will use the PyVisa package to communicate with our two instruments. And with the first two commands, we can check if we have a connection to our instruments. And this will output a list with the addresses which we need to communicate with them. So the STM3055, this is the instrument which we use as a voltmeter. We can start by executing an IDN to check if we have a connection established. Then we can reset our device and with these two commands, this is the only two we need to capture the voltage. And here we have the CMU200 which we use as signal generator. And again, we can check if we have a connection established. We will reset our device. 
Then with this command, we can set the port three as our output port. With this command, we can set the output power to minus 10 dBm, which is equal to 0.1 volt peak. And with this command, we can set the frequency to 10 megahertz. And with this command, we are applying the power. And with this command, we are stop applying the power. And as homework, your task will be to complete this script to execute the whole EMI rejection ratio test setup. No worries, it's not very complicated. As you can see here, this is the code is not very long. And in case you're not familiar with Python, I'm also happy if you send me some pseudocode instead. At the end, I will expect to obtain a figure like this one here, where we can see the EMI rejection ratio on the y-axis depending on the frequency on the x-axis. As a reminder, you can find the whole EMI rejection ratio algorithm here in the application note. In chapter 4.4, you again see summarized how the EMI rejection ratio algorithm works. And please do the homework before coming to the lab. I will summarize all the information in an email. To conclude this video, let's compare EMI rejection ratio with the more well-known DPI test method. So first, the direct power injection is standardized in IEC 62132-4, whereas the EMI rejection ratio is based on the Texas Instruments application node. Second, you can use DPI on all ICs, whereas EMI rejection ratio focuses mainly op amps. Third, DPI depends on a failure criteria, so we are increasing the power until our device under test fails, whereas in EMI rejection ratio, we are just capturing this value. And last but not least, you might have already noticed it, in EMI rejection ratio, we are focusing to be in a 50 ohm test environment, which increases comparability and repeatability. So that's it. I hope this quick introduction to EMI rejection ratio was helpful and I'm looking forward for some great discussions in our lab.